Good morning. We want to welcome everyone and thank you for being here with us today. If you would be turning your Bibles this morning to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12. Ecclesiastes 12, 13 and 14. It's good to see David back with us and glad that he's feeling like being here. We want to continue to remember him in our prayers as he has some upcoming tests. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 13 and 14. It says, if, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. You notice that last verse, verse 14. He's going to bring every work into judgment. And the last phrase is whether it be good or evil. We have to make choices in our lives and everything that we do is going to determine not only the way we're continuing to live, but our eternal destiny. In our age, we tend to see distinctions blurred and everything seems to be thrown into a, quote, gray area. People don't see black and white anymore. You start seeing things about law, people look at those things as gray areas. People look at the Bible and commandments of the Bible, people want to look at those as gray areas. But in the scriptures, matters that we deal with are clear cut when it comes to our eternal destiny. When it comes to heaven or hell and, and every decision and choice we make, we have to make sure that we're making the right choices. So this morning, I want to notice the fact that every act in our life counts because we're going to be standing in judgment one day and we're going to give an account of everything we've done, whether good or evil. So we need to make sure that we're standing on the right footing and following God. In the world, there are good people. In the world, there are also bad people. There are those good people who lovingly follow God's laws, who are trying to get to heaven, wanting to get to heaven because they're following what the Bible teaches. And then there are those who stubbornly reject Him. In Romans chapter 2, beginning in verse 5, we can read, But after the hardness and impenitent heart treasureth up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and the revelation of a righteous judgment of God who will render to every man according to his deeds. To them who are patience, continuance, and well-doing, seek glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, for the Jew first and also the Gentile. But glory and honor and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. There are two destinies that await mankind. And where we go depends on our actions. Where we go depends on what we do in this life. And that's why it's important to make every act count to do right in the sight of God. In Romans 6.16, Paul told the Romans further, Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom you obey, whether sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. We're the servants of someone, either God or the devil, either doing righteously or unrighteously. And we need to make sure that those actions are righteous actions where heaven can be our home. So as we get into this lesson and, and try to determine and look at things in the Bible that shows that every act counts, we need to make some decisions in our lives. We have to determine what we're going to do because that will also determine where we go. So in our first point on the notice this morning is that our characters are accumulation of the decisions that we've made. Our character that we have right now is what we've done through our lives in the past. We've accumulated things that have built our character where we are. When we're dissatisfied with our present state of life, 
it's very tempting to blame the circumstances and say it's beyond our control. We should have been dealt a better hand in life. And because we weren't dealt a better hand, I'm just a circumstance of my environment. That's not true. People have used that excuse for too many years. Well, I can't help what I do. I can't help the way I live. It's my environment I grew up in. Now, granted, some of the environments in which people are reared may not be the best in the world. But they don't have to be a product of that environment. They can make the decision to break that past environment in which they have lived to become a better person. People in gangs have sometimes said, well, that's where I grew up. That's the only thing I know. That's the only thing I can do. No, that's not true. People who have broken laws have said, well, I can't help it. It's just the lifestyle I grew up in. That's not true. The lifestyle doesn't have to determine the person that they were raised in. They can make those changes themselves. One of the places I preached many years ago, we had a deacon that told us that because of the lifestyle his dad tried to bring him up in, he was determined not to follow in his footsteps. He said he knew he wasn't right. He did things he shouldn't do. He was trying to teach his son some of those things. And he said, I would not do what he did. And I have determined in my life to be the total opposite of what my dad was. Even when his dad was pushing him in things, trying to teach him things, show him things that were not right, he still would not engage in those things. And he wanted to do just the opposite because he wanted to do what was right. That's what I'm talking about. Our character is an assimilation in our lives of what we've done in the past that brings us up to the present. Yet in all the most important ways, we are each the product of the decisions we've made and the freedom of our own wills. God's given us a will, and we have the freedom to choose whether to do right or whether to do wrong. We hear peer pressure all the time, and it is a real thing. But even when we're pressured by our peers to do something wrong, we don't have to give in. We can do what we know is right. We can be the one that stands up and say, no, this is not right, this is not what we should do, and I'm not going to do it. Too often, people will give in to the pressure of their peers because it's just easier. Because they go along to get along with everybody else instead of standing up for what is right. We have voluntarily thought, spoken, and done the things that have made us what we are today. Our characters are built up not from our external circumstances, but from what we have chosen to do with those circumstances. Matter of fact, look at 1 Samuel 13. And verse 14. Now this is Samuel talking to Saul. In verse 14 he says, Now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart, and the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. Saul was the first king of Israel. Given that blessing and honor and privilege to be the first king, and what did he do? He messed it up. Just to put it plain and simple, he messed it up. To begin with, he was doing what he should. But maybe over the years, because of pride and arrogance of being the king, he started doing what he wanted to do. And Samuel had to come to Saul and say, because you have done what you've done, you're no longer going to be the king. And God's going to give that to a better man. And that better man was David. The kingdom was taken away from Saul because of bad choices. He had the right to make and the will to make the right choice or choices, but he didn't. He chose things that were wrong. And David was better than Saul because he had made better choices. Not because he had better circumstances, but because he made better choices. We need to accept the responsibility for what we've made of ourselves because we are what we have chosen to be. Think in your lives. What you are right now is what you've chosen to be right now. Whether it's in your job, whether it's in your family, whether it's in your Christian life, every area of your life, you've chosen to be where you are right now. In essence, we can say we're self-made persons because of what we are. Unfortunately, there's some self-made people are often the product, I guess you could say, of unskilled labor. 
because they have just followed the wrong path without thinking the way they should be thinking, either allowing others to influence them, which is still their own will and their own choice, or just choosing to want to be evil and do wrong. Remember what Paul wrote to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 6, verses 7 and 8, where it tells us, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, for whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that, that soweth to the flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. We can sow to the flesh and reap corruption, or we can sow to the Spirit and reap eternal life with God in heaven. It's a choice. And Paul is telling the Galatians this very same thing. It's your choice. If you follow the flesh, you're going to reap corruption. You're going to lose your soul. If you sow to the Spirit, you're going to reap heaven one day. So what's your choice? Seems I remember something similar to that back in the book of Joshua. Joshua 24, 15. When Joshua told those people, Choose you this day whom you will serve. Everyone had a choice. He ended it by saying, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua made the choice. He was telling Israel, You make your choice. Are you going to serve God and go into this promised land? Or are you going to serve all these other gods in these lands we've been dwelling in? Make the choice. Can't straddle the fence. You can't have it both ways. We have to make that choice. Decision, decisions and choices have a cumulative effect. They tend to snowball. Every decision and every act will change a person for either better or worse. One is never exactly the same after any choice. When we make that choice for good, we're never the same because we've made better choices. We make those bad choices, we're never the same because we've made those worse choices. And we're traveling down different pathways. I say we, I'm talking about people in general. You have some people that are, tra that are traveling down the pathway of righteousness because they made the right choice. Those who made the wrong choices are traveling down a pathway to destruction. Our future choices have to be made by a person who has been shaped by the choices they've already made. For instance, you go back to Daniel chapter 6. In Daniel chapter 6, Daniel was chosen to be one of the governors. And the king thought very highly of Daniel. Yet some of the other governors and princes did not like Daniel. They did not like Daniel praying to God. So they talked the king into making a decree that for 30 days no one would offer any petition to anyone but the king. That's the only way they knew they could get Daniel because they knew what Daniel did. He prayed at his window every day. And in Daniel, Daniel 6 and verse 10, we can read, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Notice the very beginning when Daniel knew the writing had been signed. He knew the king had signed that decree. He knew that he was about to violate the law of that land. He knew that what he could, would do would get him thrown into a lion's den. And what did Daniel do? As he had done every day, three times a day, he went to his window toward Jerusalem and he prayed. As he did aforetime. It wasn't just by accident Daniel did that. That's what he'd been doing. That was a habit. And people talk about habits. They're good habits and bad habits. And this was a good habit. But he did it because he knew it was right. And he prayed to his God and did not care who saw him. Could Daniel have gone in and got away from his window and still prayed the same? Absolutely. But Daniel had been praying in that window three times a day for a long time. And he was not going to stop because a decree was made. He made the choice as he did aforetime. And he went back into that window and he prayed like he had been doing those choices built a habit of life for Daniel that was a good habit, even though Daniel knew the consequences of his actions. 
had he gone back into his house further and not prayed where he could, he could be seen, you know how it would look to the people? Oh, Daniel's listening to the creed. He's bowing before the king rather than before his God. You think that could have hurt Daniel's influence among those people? Absolutely. And Daniel did what he had always done. He prayed because he made that choice. With everyone, even the slightest of deeds... We're building up a character and a self that will find it progressively easier to act in certain situations in certain ways and even more difficult in other ways. You think it might have been somewhat difficult for David or to Daniel rather to know, I know what I'm doing, I know this could cause me problems. Yet he did it anyway because he knew it was right. So we're building habits by our very actions every day. We're building good habits by our actions. Or we're building bad habits by our actions. And folks, when we start building bad habits, bad habits are hard to break. Good habits often are hard to break, and we don't want to break those good habits. Because we get into that, we know it's right. But when we get into a bad habit, it's harder to break those bad habits. We have to fight harder to get rid of those bad things and to turn those into good habits and good things in our lives. But I want to say this. None of us are standing still, not you or me. Right now in your life, you're either building good habits or bad habits. You have good actions or bad actions. And I know we may slip up and make some bad decisions from time to time, but we're talking about our character, our habits, our actions on a regular daily basis. None of us are standing still. We're either growing in Christ or we're slipping further and further away from Him. And we have to make that decision what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. Next, it's sobering to think that every act counts. I say that because we're going to stand before God one day. And when we stand before God, we're going to be judged. And it's sobering to think if we've got those bad habits and bad actions in our lives, what's going to happen? No decision we make is too small or insignificant. When you think in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, when it tells us we're all going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account of the things which we've done in this body according to that which we've done, whether it be good or bad. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and God will take every act into account when He judges our lives. No decision is going to be too small. Now one thing we can't do, remember as children playing on the playground or playing in the yard with your friends or cousins or siblings and in the middle of playing something happens, you say, oh, that didn't count. Or you make a promise and you have your fingers crossed. Oh, I had my fingers crossed. That didn't count. You think you can stand before God and say, God, I had my fingers crossed on that one. That shouldn't count, should it? You think God's going to accept that excuse? No, He's not. We've got to realize as grown adults, we can't say, well, that didn't count. I take it back. I want to do over. It's going to be too late. Because we're going to stand before Him and give an account the sentencing date, the sentencing time of our actions. And we're either going to be, if you want to use a court term, acquitted, exonerated, found innocent, however you want to put it, or found guilty. But we're going to stand before that judgment seat of Christ, the court of heaven, and give an account of what we've done in this life. We may think we're being merely careless or haphazard, and that shouldn't be held against us. But the consequences of our choices are eternal. And we're responsible for them. There's no do-overs or going back. It's going to be the end or the goal or the outcome of those acts. In Romans 6.21, we can read, What fruit had ye then in those things wherever you're now shamed? For the end of those things is death. End of those things is death, eternal death. So every action has consequences. 
And God will not mistakenly or accidentally consign someone to eternal punishment. God's not going to look back after judgment and say, Oh, you know what? I messed up. I shouldn't have sentenced this person to devil's hell. He's not going to make that mistake. He's a just God. Only those who are going to be lost are those who demanded to be there by their own choices. People will go to court sometime and even throw themselves in the mercy of the court and say, please forgive me, I'm sorry, and give me another chance, I won't do it again. People may try that with God. But if we lose our souls in hell, it's our own fault. It's our own fault if it happens. Even people I've arrested before have admitted they did something and apologized, asked to be let go, and then we'll say, no, you're going to jail. Then after calling me every name in the book, they'll say it's my fault for sending them there, that I'm ruining their life. I don't know how many times I've had people say, you're ruining my life for what you're doing. I said, no, you're ruining your own life because you're poor choices. It's your fault. Don't blame me that you're in handcuffs. Don't blame me you're going to jail. You made the decision to break the law. It's all on you now. And they're still usually not happy with that because they want a second chance. I had a person say, if you just let me go, I promise I'll never do this again. Then when you look back on their history, their criminal history, you'll see they've done that over and over and over again. If they continue to do it, they're not going to do any better until they make the choice to do better. And if they continue to make bad choices, they're proving that they're still doing wrong. And we can't stand before God and say, God, I've made some poor choices, but I'm sorry. Those who are going to be lost in hell demand to be there because of what they've done themselves. Sooner or later, someone said, we must all sit down at the banquet of consequences. That's the sobering part. But next, and finally, I want to look at the encouraging part. Because it's also encouraging to think that every act counts. We can never truly say in our lives that we're helpless and hopeless. We can do something that will alter the situations in our lives for the better if we'll make the choices for the better. In spiritual matters, there's no such thing as a stalemate. In spiritual matters, if we're doing what is right, God's pleased with us and He's blessing us. We need to have the same confidence that Samuel had in 1 Samuel seventeen twenty six. When they were all standing before Goliath and no one wanted to go in before him. In verse 26, and it says, And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? David said, Why don't y'all go out and fight him? Who's afraid of him? What's going to be done for the man who does go kill him? And we know what David did. David went out and killed Goliath, that big old Philistine giant. And he was just a young boy. All the seasoned veteran military people there who had fought wars, who were willing to fight more wars, were afraid of that one man. And yet a small boy went out and defeated him because he said, God is with me. And he knew that God would deliver him. And he did. See, David had the confidence that God is on my side. I'm going to win this battle. We need to have that same confidence in our lives that when we're living a Christian life, knowing that God is on our side, we're going to win. We're on the winning team. We can act in faith that helps us as we walk in the right direction of goodness and truth. And even the smallest of acts when we do right are not insignificant. We do things in our Christian life, we say, well, that wasn't much. Or we don't think anything about it. But when we do right and we're not trying to count up, oh, I did a good act here. God, there's another one. Remember that. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about when we're just living a Christian life and we do little things. They're significant even with God. God looks at those things, even the, what we consider small things, and sees us doing right. He continues to bless us. And I use the, the term little things or small things because that's the way we look at them. doesn't mean that's the way God looks at them. 
Heaven will be the outcome if we learn to choose actions that are appropriate. And if we follow God's path and we serve God faithfully and we do God's will, then we know that God's going to bless us. In Romans 6.23, it tells us the wages of sin is death, but, and I like that but there, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. God's gift for us, salvation through Jesus Christ, if we live a Christian life, we do what is right, but the wages of sin is death. We put that behind us. If we've made the right choices and we've built our character of where we should be right now and living the way we should be living, then we don't worry about the first part of that verse. We look at the last part of that verse. The gift of God is going to come through Jesus Christ for those of us who are faithful. And we must remain faithful and do His will if heaven will be our home one day. Folks, life's serious business. This is not a time of fun and games. There's nothing wrong with having fun and games in our lives, but life is not a life of fun and games. Life is serious. And we need to take it seriously. Because when we do, in living a faithful life, we know where we're going to be. And it pays to live life carefully. We need to be sobered by the fact that each action reaches into eternity. And we also need to be sobered on the fact that we need to take responsibility for the bad choices we have made and make amends for that through our repentance, through a changing of our life and putting those bad choices behind us. Again, as I mentioned earlier, bad choices and bad habits sometimes are harder to break, but we can break them, we can put them behind us, and we can move forward living a Christian life and doing it faithfully. So we can enjoy heaven as our eternal home. But in all things, we need to be thankful. We need to be thankful that we've have, we have the opportunity to make better choices right now. We're still living right now. We don't know how long that's going to last. We don't know how long we're going to be here. We may be here another 10, 15, 20. Some people may be here for 50, 60, 70 more years. We don't know. But we also don't know when the Lord's coming again. So we need to be ready now. And we need to be making the right choices and right decisions in our lives. We need to remember that every act counts, even the little ones. So in your life today, what are you doing? What kind of choices are you making? What kind of character do you have right now? Are you living in such a way that if you died right now, heaven would be your home? Or through bad choices in your life, you know that you wouldn't be in heaven? The wonderful thing about this today is we're about to sing an invitation song. And if you've made bad choices, whether they're recent bad choices or accumulation of bad choices that is changing your character for the worse, if you're a Christian, you can make those changes today. If you're not a Christian, you can as well. But if you are a child of God, you're not living the Christian life like you should. You're not being like Christ, as the word Christian tells us. Then why not come back and repent of those sins? As a child of God, you've already been saved by the blood of Christ, but if you are not walking in the light, you've left it and gone back into darkness. And God's second law of pardon allows you to come back and repent of your sins, confess them. And as we find in the book of Acts, we'll pray for you that those sins won't be held to your account. If you're not a Christian, you've never obeyed Jesus Christ, you're living in a life of sin because of your choices. But you can make a change today. If you believe with all your heart Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and you're willing to change your life, you don't want to live in sin anymore, you want to get out of it, and you want to do, do what's right, and you want to make better choices in your life, through your belief in Jesus, you can come today changing your life in repentance turning away from sin to turn to Christ. And when you repent of your sins, you can come confessing Jesus Christ with a mouth. And upon that confession of faith, in Acts chapter 8, verse 37, we find in verse 38, when the eunuch made his confession, Philip took him down to the water and baptized him. And when he came up out of the water, he was rejoicing because through the blood of Christ he was saved. And you can do that today. We can immerse you in baptism to add you to the Lord's church as your sins are washed away in your baptism. 
and Christ will heal you. And you can start living a faithful child, life as a child of God, as a Christian. And heaven will be your eternal home when this life is over. If you are subject in any way, we ask you to come right now. Why together we stand and why we sing.